Thank you for coming to this uh, state-of-the-art talk organized by the Economic Geology Research Unit at uh, James Cook University. Uh, we are organizing this every few months, having uh, experts from around the world coming and giving us talks and uh, taking advantage of the newly discovered online world, which we suddenly discovered a year and a bit ago. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Thomas Blenkisop, who is a professor of structural geology, and he's also been working as an economic geologist. So Tom graduated in UK at Oxford University. He moved to US, then he moved to Africa, then he moved to Australia, where he's been at James Cook University, where he held the position of uh, structural geologist and director of AGRU. And after that, he moved back to UK to University of, uh, of Cardiff. So Paul has been working, I, if I'm correct, most of his life on structural geology, but particular structural geology applied to mineral deposits. And most of his research was focused on um, orogenic gold, IOCG type deposits, but also Tom touched on other deposit types. So, that's introducing Tom. And before we start, I'd like to just to set up a few rules so we can uh, have this in an organized manner and we are not uh, getting all over the place. So please turn off your microphone if you can. So no noises can um, disturb while uh, Tom is, uh, is talking. And if you can turn off your video, sometimes uh, it, it works really well for people which their internet connection is not, it's not very good. In terms of questions, I think the best way to deal with question will be if you write the questions in, uh, in the chat and myself, Kylene and Judy will compile these questions and we will read them uh, to Tom. This, this meeting it's recorded, so please be aware of that and, uh, and, the, and the presentation itself will be shared on our Agro website and on, uh, and on YouTube, on our Agro YouTube. So that being said, I think I'm gonna let Tom start his presentation and thank you very much, Tom, for doing this. We're looking forward to hear from you. Well, thank you very much, Jan, for that introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be, uh, as it were, back at JCU. Uh, I've seen that there are many uh, familiar faces uh, listening at the moment, and that is tremendous to make uh, contact back with you again. But I suppose really the most important, uh, some of the most important people here are the names uh, of my collaborators on this presentation here on the screen in front of you, including Jan and of course, including Paul. And um, I've just heard the really good news that Paul is making a strong recovery. And of course, our thoughts are with, with him and his family very much at this time. I should also say that uh, there are probably a, a number of you here who even who, who have also contributed directly or indirectly to what I'm going to say. And I'm very grateful for numerous collab collaborations I've had over many years in applying structural geology to hydrothermal mineralization. So my pitch today uh, to you is that if we were as a structural geologist to tackle a, a problem say the evolution of a mountain belt, we might um, typically follow a sort of a, a, a procedure, something like this, in which we'd start off by some data gathering exercise. And perhaps one of the first things we would then do is to try and assess the geometry, typically by measuring structures in the field. We would then uh, try to analyze the displacements, um, which we can infer from those geometries, kinematic analysis, uh, which is all really about strain and displacement. And we might then take the further step to try to understand something about the stresses by doing some sort of paleo stress analysis before we put it all together in um, a, a, an analysis which relates the displacement strains and stresses uh, by a mechanic, mechanical analysis and considers the rheology of the rock types. That's what typically we would do as a, as a structural geologist. And my pitch today to you is that uh, it's actually very helpful to try to apply that same sort of analysis when we're trying to understand hydrothermal ore bodies. And I will take you through um, sections of this talk uh, 
which illustrate those three first steps in particular, the geometrical, kinematic and dynamic analysis, a little bit about the final step as well. And try to illustrate why each of them separately has got something useful and important to contribute to understanding hydrothermal mineralization. So that's my pitch and hopefully we'll get there in the end. So uh, I'll next um, start at the sort of very basic level of, of geometry um, by dividing up all bodies into tabular ore bodies, which follow planar structures such as unconformities or deformation zones, and elongate ore bodies, which might be controlled by structures such as boudin necks or fold hinges. Of course, it's also possible to have ore bodies which have combinations of both uh, planar and elongate elements, and we'll consider those sorts of geometries in a bit more detail in a few slides time. But fundamentally, one of the things we do want to understand from a geometrical analysis is what is the nature of the structures which are controlling the ore body. Looking at that another way, we can um, arrange individual structures and groups of structures in a diagram like this, which proceeds from uh, the, the individual feature at the top, be it a fault, a vein, or a fabric in a shear zone, into a deformation zone here in the middle, which incorporates a number of additional features in, a, in some sort of tabular zone. And then very importantly, to bear in mind that at a still larger scale, those deformation zones are themselves organized into some sort of network. And this is, uh, I think, an in increasingly important thing that we need to understand more about in terms of hydrothermal ore bodies, the way in which networks themselves have got a larger scale organization, uh, sorry, uh, deformation zones themselves have got a larger scale organization. Now, another feature of this diagram, which is important, is the, the transition from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, which corresponds to features which are discontinuous, like fractures and faults, to those which are continuous. And I'm using shear zone in the specific sense to indicate a zone of continuous deformation here. Now, having used those two words, it's immediately important to add that defining discontinuous or continuous deformation is essentially a matter of scale, and that what looks continuous at one scale, when you look at it in more detail, can appear to be discontinuous. So whenever we use those two words, we need to also immediately qualify them with the scale at which we're making those distinctions. So those are generally some sort of preliminary um, comments on geometry. And um, I'm next going to just show you a few, few field examples of structural, uh, of deformation zones which control mineralization and explore a little bit this spectrum between uh, the fault zones and the shear zones in this diagram here. Uh, starting off in the top uh, left-hand corner, we've got a, a, an extensional quartz carbonate vein from Sunrise Dam with, with visible gold spectacularly coursing through the middle of it, a, an extremely discontinuous feature at the scale of millimeters to centimeters indicated by the pencil here. Also uh, from Sunrise Dam, uh, we have a, this uh, spectacular breccia, which is very high grade ore body. Again, a very discontinuous feature at a scale of centimeters. Moving down, uh, we see from Gaeta in Tanzania, this interesting deformation zone about uh, 10 centimeters wide or so, which where we've got a combination of features, discontinuous features indicated by the veins here and more continuous features indicated by a foliation uh, parallel to these dotted lines here. This sort of combination of discontinuous and continuous deformation at the same scale is very, very common in hydrothermal mineralization. On the right hand side, there's a a slightly more continuous example from also from Sunrise Dam, uh, in which we can see a strong foliation, but that foliation is actually made out of fragments of um, veins, so an earlier event of discontinuous deformation. And then moving down to the bottom, Tropicana gold mine here on the left hand side, very penetrative, continuous foliations here, a very continuous style of deformation at the centimeter scale, defining these coarse. SC fabrics in the core here, which are brilliant kinematic indicators. 
and then from the Cornish mine in Western Australia, a, a very strong uh, amphibolite fasces schistosity in this, this shear zone here, a very continuous style of deformation. So really the point I want to make here is that it is surprising how many of um, hydrothermal gold mineral deposits anyway, fall into this sort of middle category here, where we've got mixtures of discontinuous and continuous deformation. And we sometimes are tempted to divide those into different deformation episodes or stages, uh, characterizing the discontinuous deformation as one stage and a later continuous one or vice versa. But that is a very big mistake in many cases, as indicated by, for example, the, the Gator Gold Mine story, where we have clearly episodes uh, in a repeated fashion of both continuous and discontinuous deformation, all within the same kinematic framework. And th this is, of course, actually something that we should expect when we realize that deformation is controlled not just by um, a particular set of uh, stresses in a static orientation with static values, but that deformation is controlled by a whole number of variables and pore fluid pressure is one of the most important ones which can vary on very short time and spatial scales. And that within a given deformation episode, therefore, it is completely understandable that we cycle between discontinuous and continuous deformation and we cannot use those criteria to divide up different deformation episodes. So that's, a, 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 I think, a very important general geometrical point to make. Now I'm going on and in this slide and in a number of others to explore really the application of new ideas in structural geology to hydrothermal mineralization. And this is one that I'm particularly keen on. Um, and it concerns how uh, faults organize themselves, the geometry of fault systems. Now we're very used to the, the picture on the left-hand side here where for a given stress state with maximum principal stress sigma one vertical here, we might find conjugate pairs of faults in two different orientations formed symmetrically about the principal stresses. That is a standard sort of um, textbook analysis of faulting or understanding of faulting. But actually, um, for a number of years now, we've realized that uh, faults formed in the same deformation event may have the more complicated geometries indicated over here by the fact that we have not just two conjugate orientations, but four orientations accommodating a single deformation event indicated by the great circles here on the stereonet. And the key thing about this understanding, which we call multiple fault sets or sometimes polymodal fault sets, is that they are organized symmetrically about the principal strains. This is a, an analysis which is based on strain rather than stress. And it is also intuitive in a way that this should be a more general case than the conjugate case, because this is the only way which we can use faults to accommodate truly triaxial deformation. That means shortening in one direction, extension in two directions, or shortening in two and extension in three directions. As long as we have three directions in which we need to accommodate strains, then we're going to need it is an absolute necessity that we have more than two orientations of fault, and four is a common uh, configuration that we find. So this seems to me like a, 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 a very important new understanding about faulting. And we can continue it a little bit further into a diagram like this in which we have seen, we see basically the uh, arrangement of um, orthorhombic or polymodal faults here and down here, and that the specific geometry of those fault sets will depend on the type of three-dimensional deformation which is being accommodated. In the top two um, figures, we have a, a, a prolate strain or a constrictional strain, which is extending in one direction and shortening in two directions. In the bottom figures, we have a flattening strain, shortening in one direction and elongation in two directions. So those are the two polymodal faults 
geometries we might expect in response to that uh, overall bulk deformation. But it has also been shown that it's not just faults that behave like this in when we look at the network of, of these deformation features. Shear zones also can arrange themselves to accommodate uh, bulk strains in different um, overall geometries. So for example, if we look at constriction, what we find is that the shear zones organize themselves to isolate bodies of rock, which are linear um, in shape, lithons, if you like, between the various shear zones. Whereas in a flattening situation, the shear zones will organize themselves to accommodate or, or surround flat bodies of lithons, which are reflecting that flattening strain. So this is uh, now known from both theoretical and practical examples to be how shear zones and faults organize themselves in response to bulk strain. Well, so much for the uh, academic structural geology. Is there really any uh, evidence that this does apply to hydrothermal min mineralization? I'd like you to, uh, to draw your attention to this very interesting study by Dubé and others in 1989 from the Norbo mine in Quebec, in which they identified a number of uh, auriferous veins in different orientations. And these veins themselves were organized around a an axis which what did correspond to one of the principal strains. So this is a beautiful example of how multiple fault sets, in fact, have got a direct geometrical control on the ore body. And I think as we increasingly recognize how common the um, arrangement of polymodal faults is, we're going to find that it applies in detail to more and more hydrothermal ore bodies. I now want to move on to Another new development in geometry within structural geology, which is concerned with the connectivity of um, fault and fracture networks. And this, this sort of approach, um, loosely described as network analysis, has been pioneered by, um, by people like Sanderson and Nixon and others, and, um, and is really inspired by working on seismic reflection data sets in the oil industry, for example. And here you see in front of you a, a fault network, which is divided up into segments between ends or nodes in the fault and uh, where different fractures and faults cross each other. And this is the key, as the key thing for defining the connectivity of this fracture network is to concentrate on these nodes and the intervening fracture branches as they're called. If we look at this network, we can recognize that there are three types of node, the so-called I nodes, the green nodes here at the ends of fractures. We've got the Y nodes in the, in the red triangles where one fracture joins another one. And we've got the X nodes where two fractures cross each other. And clearly the more connected the network, the more X and Y nodes we're likely to see at the proportion at the expense of I nodes. And this gives us a relatively straightforward and objective way to characterize the connectivity of this fracture network. It's the proportion basically of X and Y nodes to I nodes. And here in fact is in the next slide a picture of an analysis from a auriferous um, network of fracture zones, which are analyzed within this scan line, the purple scan line here, for the different types of I, Y, and X nodes with slightly different coloring from the previous uh, picture, sorry about that. But here we can see the I nodes in red, the Y nodes in green, and the X nodes in, in blue. And we can, in fact, use a simple count of the number of those nodes with this formula to define the connectivity. The larger this number, the larger the connectivity of this network. This, uh, and we can plot that in a triangular diagram, for example, with I nodes up here, Y and X nodes here. That particular network in their plots up here, these are contours of connectivity, showing that the value of the connectivity in this picture particular network is about one, and that's quite a low value. The maximum value of connectivity at the bottom of this picture is two, maximum possible connectivity value. Now, just before leaving um, to give you an example of applying this method, 
it's also worth pointing out that connectivity is, is only one aspect of a fracture network. Um, completely independently, and I'll show this for you in a minute, is the concept of intensity. So we can have a highly connected network with just two fractures, essentially, if they cross each other. We also need, therefore, to define something about the intensity of the fracturing. And the circular scanline method is the now accepted, um, very elegant way of doing this. We simply have to count the number of fractures which intersect the circular scanline and use this formula to define the intensity. So now let's turn to an example. And I'm going to come back to Sunrise Dam a number of times in, in this presentation. So it might be worth just introducing Sunrise Dam gold mine in the Ilgaon Craton in the e Eastern Goldfields province over here. Current resource about 4 million ounces. Uh, at times, Sunrise Dam has actually outproduced Golden Mile at Kalgoorlie uh, briefly, but uh, it does represent a, um, even if it's no longer doing that, represents a major gold resource um, historically and currently um, in Australia. And it many, in many ways is a very typical Archean low gold deposit hosted in greenstone belts, in a greenstone belt here, the Laverton greenstone belt, with a variety of host rock types, including banded iron formations, uh, volcanic plastic rocks, um, and uh, various sorts of porphyry as well. Um, as you would expect for any large um, gold mine in the Ilgarn, it is an extremely complicated ore body in detail. And here in this picture where we can see the open pit and the underground ore bodies, which are now uh, providing the ore, they are divided up into a number of discrete um, um, groups of, of, of ore bodies uh, named, for example, the Western Shear Zone, the Sunrise Shear Zone, Astro, Cosmo and Dolly. And each individual group of, of ore bodies is itself incredibly complicated in, in geometry, in geometrical features. And we will explore a little bit more about the detail of, of these, um, these, the geometry of these ore bodies in subsequent slides. But I want to just draw attention to where we're going now, which is a particular part of the astro ore body, a development drive within the astro ore body. And it looks like this underground, a network of quartz carbonate veins with sulfides and gold within them, which can be mapped out very nicely um, using uh, a mosaic of, of photographs um, in the underground development here. And essentially, uh, the color coding for these fractures here, green, uh, yellow, or blue, corresponds to three relatively discrete orientations of fracture, which go essentially really to form what is a stockwork of um, gold bearing veins. So a rather useful place to try to apply the technique of network analysis, which I just described to you. So here is the outcome of that. Um, what we're doing is setting up a circular scan line here. And within that scan line, we're identifying the I, Y, and X nodes and giving them a count and therefore able to calculate a connectivity value and also um, from the intersections of fractures with the periphery of the scan line, we can look at the, um, the, the intensity of fracturing. And I must now uh, change back to the pointer so that I can play this little movie. We can move our scan line along the map, and at any particular point, we can calculate our I, Y, and X nodes. And as the scan circle moves to this point, you can see that suddenly there's an, a dramatic increase in the number of I nodes. So this is becoming less connected here compared to the blue and the green nodes, which are more common in other places. And then we can um, make a plot for each uh, different position of the circular scan line of the connectivity against the intensity. And the, the only point that I want to make about this plot is that there is no relationship um, between the connectivity and the intensity which is uh, why we need to measure both of them. Well, that's our ongoing work. I, I just want to finish off talking about network connectivity by showing you another study which has, has, has applied this technique to um, Quebec, Quebec, gold deposit in Quebec, and basically um, looking at connectivity down a drill hole 
and correlating it with goal grade, there seems to be some interesting relationships between high values of connectivity and the goal. Let me move on now to kinematics after spending quite a long time on geometry. And I want to talk now about shear zones. And the diagram that we have in front of us is the conventional view, I think that many people have of, of a shear zone in which we have a foliation curving in to become roughly parallel to the shear plane in the center of the shear zone and a lineation doing the same thing so that it becomes parallel to the shear direction. This would be what we technically call a simple shear zone because it involves simple shear, which is a technical rather than a, a, a layman's term in to, to describe the displacement field, which um, is corresponding to this sort of shear zone. Now, one thing that we've been coming uh, to realize recently is that there's another geometrical element of this shear zone, which is very useful to define. It's called the vorticity vector, and it is an axis which is perpendicular to the shear direction. You can think of it, if you like, as the rolling axis, the axle uh, uh, on which the rotational component of the shear is accommodated. Um, this is something that we increasingly talk about in the context of shear zones. And I'm going to take that concept and uh, apply that to a um, diagrammatic version of a shear zone here, in which we can see that the shear plane is vertical. So we're looking at a strike slip uh, configuration here. We're looking at a vertical vorticity vector in this, this strike slip shear zone. We've got a lineation in the center of the shear zone, which with progressive deformation will become parallel to the shear direction. So the key thing here when we have a large simple shear component is that we've got a lineation and shear direction perpendicular to our vorticity vector. And that corresponds more more or less to the same uh, geometry that we saw in the previous slide, except tilted around now on the side to reflect um, wrench tectonics. And Tickoff and Tessier in 1993 called this wrench dominated transpression. What it means is basically that the simple shear component of this deformation is dominant, but there's also a component of shortening across the shear zone, subordinate to the simple shear component. What uh, Basil Tickoff and co-workers showed in a series of absolutely brilliant papers in the early 90s is that that geometry fundamentally changes if you increase the shortening across the shear zone. So you now shorten across the shear zone as well as continuing to share it, but you increase that amount of shortening. What you find is a geometry like this in which the lineation flips to become parallel to the vorticity vector. And that they call pure shear dominated transpression. And that is a very profound change in the geometry of the, uh, of the shear zone and its kinematics. So taking those ideas, we can apply them hypothetically to all bodies which might form in that situation. So we're again dealing with a wrench configuration, strike slip configuration, in which the vorticity vector in all cases will be vertical. Now, if the lineation is horizontal and uh, it is controlling the fluid flow, we might end up with a situation like this in which the ore body is therefore horizontal in this wrench configuration. But if while, com while maintaining a simple shear dominant component, there are intersecting fabrics or jogs, for example, in the shear zone, then they may have a dominant effect. And even though it's simple shear, we may find that the ore body is vertical and parallel to the vorticity vector. Whereas for the pure shear dominated case, really there's only one place to go, and that is a vertical ore body, because everything, the vorticity vector and the lineation are lining up in that vertical orientation. So we can suggest from a theoretical point of view, at least, that there are actually these three possibilities, two of them with simple shear dominant, one of which all bodies will be parallel to lineation and the other perpendicular to it, and the third case of pure shear dominant kinematics in which the all bodies are going to be parallel to L. Well again you might ask yourself well that's all very well from the theoretical point of view but are there actually examples? I think um, there are examples and quite a few of them but here are just three um, from previous studies in Zimbabwe in which we can identify each of those three cases. Renko mine, uh, 
is a case of simple shear dominated uh, kinematics in which we find the all bodies parallel to the lineation and perpendicular to the red dot, which is the vorticity vector. The other type of simple shear dominated case might be represented by chamvermine, in which we find all bodies which are vertical, parallel to the vorticity vector and perpendicular to the shear direction and the lineations. So this is the perpendicular to the lineation or body case. And the final case of pure shear dominated where everything lines up, in this case subvertically, is represented by the Arcturus mine, where again, the all bodies are parallel to lineation and parallel to vorticity vector. So there are examples of how in detail this understanding of the pure shear component of deformation zones, shear zones, is very, very important in understanding the controls on all, body, all bodies. And I'm just going to explore that a little bit more with um, a few more slides examining in more detail the Renko configuration. So we are talking here about the southern margin of the Zimbabwe craton and the Katva craton between which is the Limpopo belt of high grade granulite fasces gneisses. And we're talking about the Renko mine, which is just set 10 kilometers uh, to the south of this important contact between the high grade gneisses in the Limpopo belt and the Archean typical granite greenstone, greenstone fasces uh, to amphibonite fasces of the Zimbabwe craton, just a, a few kilometers south into the Limpopo belt. So Renko mine is actually a very interesting mineral deposit because it is one of relatively few uh, Archean gold deposits which are not hosted in the granite greenstone terrain but all, instead the high grade um, granulite fasces nice terrain. So uh, exploring a little bit more the uh, geometry of this at a large scale, the North Limpopo thrust zone, this contact between the Limpopo belt and the Zimbabwe craton looks like this in the field, a zone of spectacular myelinites with wonderful shear sense indicators, uh, which are clearly indicating that reverse sensor movement with the Limpopo belt, the high grade rocks being thrust over the Zimbabwe craton. And at other places, we can see this contact here, uh, crossing uh, various types of gneisses and granites of the craton. And very critically, um, we can see that where that contact crosses this green dike, which is a satellite dike of the Great Dike, there's absolutely no displacement. The dike is completely undeformed there. The uh, plains of the northern Popo thrust zone in this vicinity, all dipping to the southeast with down dip lineations, reverse senses of shear, indicated by uh, beautiful delta-type porphyroclast systems like this, and dating, therefore, the movement on this North Limpopo thrust zone as preceding the intrusion of the Great Dyke at 2461 million years, so Archean. And if we zoom in now to Renko mine, remembering that it's just 10 kilometers south of the North Limpopo thrust zone, we see that it is, the mine is hosted in a, 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 re, a relatively massive body of endivite, which is a type of granulite fasces um, nice. The reefs are in a northeast or east-west orientation, the gold bearing reefs. And in fact, um, that northeast orientation there is very closely parallel to the North Limpopo thrust zone. So that in cross section from um, Jürgen Kolb's work, and we can put the whole thing together in a cartoon like this. We've got the North Limpopo thrust zone here, moving the um, high grade gneisses in the northern marginal zone of the Limpopo belt up over the craton. Renko reefs are actually on sub, sub parallel structure, dipping towards the southeast. And underneath in the foot wall are the green schist to amphibolite fasces gneiss, which Yoakum suggests are the source of fluids which might have contributed to the hydrothermal mineralization at Renko in the late Archean. Okay, so I'm just going to explore the all body geometry a little bit more at Renko using this scheme here where we simplify the all bodies into an ellipsoid with a, a long axis, an intermediate axis and a short axis, U, V and W. We can measure these in a simple minded sort of way by looking at the um, all body, the resource model. And we find in fact that when we do that, there are 
a, a group of all bodies which are basically dipping fairly shallowly to the southeast, like the ones uh, parallel to the North Limpopo thrust zone that we mentioned previously, but there are also a group of steeper all bodies which are striking east-west and basically subvertical. And we can measure their U and V and W axes, plot them up in serenets. The summary of that is that there are a group, this group of all bodies dipping uh, moderately to gently southeast. The long axes of those all bodies are down dip. Here's a group of all bodies which are subvertical with their long axes uh, also being vertical. And we can um, summarize all of that in a sketch like this, where you can see the so-called shallow ore bodies dipping to the southeast with their or uh, high-grade high ore shoots within them and the, the vertical ore bodies here with their high-grade ore shoots as well. We can plot uh, ratios between U and V and V and W, which many of you uh, as structural geologists will recognize is inspired by the Flynn plot for analyzing strain for the gently dipping bodies and the steeply dipping all bodies, noting that there's a sort of spread of values uh, in, in, this, in these sorts of plots, basically trending from top left to bottom right. And one way to interpret that is shown on this slide here, in which we can theoretically model that sort of spread um, using a, a parameter called J um, with a sequence of um, evolution of the ore body consisting of it starting off with an ellipsoid or shape like this, growing in a fairly self-similar manner up to this point here, where adjacent ore bodies may suddenly merge, corresponding to this drop in the value of J. And then there may be another merger where two ore bodies incorporate a third ore body. So we're basically probably seeing in this sequence of um, different shapes of the ore body measured by their U, V and W axes, we're probably seeing the growing of this ore body by coalescence of adjacent ore bodies. And to finally finish off on, uh, on Renko, a few slides to summarize that uh, in a more general way, we've got the shallowly dipping ore bodies parallel to the lineations and the shear directions on those. The same is true for the steeply ore body, steeply dipping ore bodies, the lineations are vertical here. And so there is a very strong kinematic control on these ore bodies by the kinematics of these deformation zones. And that's the fundamental point really about this study is to illustrate the kinematic control of these ore bodies. But I am just going to deviate a little bit in the next couple of slides from my progression from geometry to kinematics to dynamics to talk uh, a little bit ahead of myself about rheology. Because I want to use the uh, very elegant work by Alex Kisters, including uh, and his group, in, who included Johan Kolb, I just mentioned, on the appearance of the ore bodies underground. And what they found is that the ore bodies, the sulfide ore bodies, were concentrated in rock bodies of called lithons, surrounded by um, very much more intensely deformed shear fabrics of myelinites within these shear zones. And it, it was in the lithons that we found the highest concentration of sulfides and the highest concentration of gold. And that occurred because these lithons were bodies of altered rock, which were more competent than the surrounding myelinites. And therefore, during deformation, they fractured, creating space which could then be filled by the gold-bearing sulfides. So the key thing here is that on the ore body scale, it is the rheological contrast between the lithons and the myelinites, which has given rise to the gold precipitating mechanism. So once again, to emphasize uh, the importance of rheology, understanding rheology, even in this qualitative way for uh, understanding the mineralizing process. Well, that brings us nicely on uh, with one more slide on kinematics, just to mention that um, these sorts of features distinguishing between simple shear dominant and pure shear dominant shear zones are very straightforward in exploration drill core because we have this unique or often um, very special, completely three-dimensional exposure of shear zones. So it's very easy in, or it can be quite easy in a shear, shear zone environment to use exploration drill core to look at kinematics. <laughs> 
So that does bring us on to dynamics. And I just want to, in the next couple of slides, introduce you to a couple of techniques, new techniques which we can apply, and particularly to talk about the slip tendency, which is um, a very handy way of looking at the propensity of any plane to fail by slip in a given stress field. So the slip tendency is defined with respect to the shear stresses and the normal stresses and the coefficient of friction. And we can think of it as a, on a more diagram like this. Here's a, a failure envelope. Here's a state of stress. The slip tendency of one would be indicated by this point here, where actually the plane is at failure. Other planes, which um, are represented um, by points in the red area of this three-dimensional Moore diagram have got slip tendencies of less than one and are less likely to fail. And we can examine that on a stereo net in these diagrams here. In these diagrams, we ha have shown the slip tendency for a maximum principal stress of north-south horizontal, an intermediate principal stress vertical, and a least principal stress east-west horizontal, so a strike slip type of shear zone. And each point on this stereo net has been colored with its slip tendency according to the color scale down here, showing that there's quite uh, a, a complicated pattern indeed of slip tendencies for um, different stress states. And this is what I want to also use this slide to talk about, the increasing realization that we know as structural geologists, or, or have known for a while, but are increasingly able to appreciate its importance now, of the intermediate principal stress in determining stress state and the failure mode. So that is encapsulated in these diagrams by drawing each one for a different value of the parameter phi given by sigma two minus sigma three over sigma one minus sigma three. This value phi varies between zero when sigma two is equal to sigma three, the magnitude of sigma two is equal to sigma three, to one where the magnitude of sigma two is equal to sigma one. And it has a dramatic effect on the slip tendency in these diagrams. Compare this diagram for phi value of zero with this one for phi value of one. So this diagram is, uh, this, this slide is introducing two or three really important new concepts. The slip tendency itself as a measure of the propensity of a, a plane to fail. The effect of the stress ratio, which we're increasingly realizing is very important. And lastly, in the bottom row, uh, another parameter which we can um, calculate very easily for any plane, which is the tendency for it simply to open or dilate, called the dilation tendency, which has different patterns from the slip tendency, but is also influenced very strongly by the stress ratio phi. So I'm going to show you some applications of slip tendency analysis. I'm also going to talk about modern methods of paleo stress analysis, um, in particular the inversion method, which is a particularly useful method to use because we get out of it the orientations of the stress tensor and the stress ratio, unlike some of the other methods which we can only give the orientations of the principal stresses. And again, I'm going to go back to Sunrise Dam to uh, mention that, as you would expect with this vast and complicated ore body, there's also a complicated history of deformation stages, which we can clearly separate from each other by different kinematics, starting with uh, a D1 event, which is, as usual in the yoga, somewhat enigmatic. Some people think D1 is a, a contractional event. Other people think it's essential. Every, most people recognize there's a, a regional east-west D2 shortening event. Um, that is followed at Sunrise Dam by porphyry intrusion before a major deformation in D3 consisting of both thrusting and sinistral wrenching. It's a strike slip uh, stress regime essentially, and the maximum principal stress is in the southeast horizontal orientation. The phi value from doing those fault inversions is about 0.5. Then there is more porphyry dike intrusion. And we've dated, or these dates have been dated at 2674, so late Archean in age, typical. And then we have a D4 deformation event, which is um, dextral, strike slip faulting, but now the sigma one orientation is east northeast. And look how the phi value has almost doubled 
and that continues into D5 and then there's some post mineralizing events. So the really important events for mineralization are the D3 and the D4 and they're characterized by very different stress fields. As shown on this slide here, in which if we just focus on the sigma one dots, the red dots for D3 down here, southeast horizontal, up to here for D4, and then back down here to D5. So temporal variation in different deformation episodes, but also spatial variability. While many of the D4 stress fields, sigma one values are, are, are indeed up here, there are a few in different orientations. So we have temporal and spatial variability. That spatial variability is examined for D4 here from different parts of the mine. We can see that the sigma one orientations vary according to position in the mine. So here we're getting for a very important feel for the complexity of the, the stress field, the dynamic effects on all bodies and the importance of understanding this in some detail. And I'll try to illustrate that a little bit more with some of my last few slides here. Here is a, a picture of one of the major um, structures which control the ore bodies, the so Sunrise Shear Zone at Sunrise Down Gold Mine. And it's not flat, of course. And those irregularities can be contoured or coloured in terms of their slip tendency for a given stress field. So what we're seeing here are colours representing the slip tendency for the D4 stress field. And they're beginning to define very interesting areas on the sun ratio zone with a more or less down dip orientation, which could correspond to high grade ore bodies. And to take this to its final conclusion, I want to introduce how we can use the, those dynamic results, the um, stress tensors that we've obtained from the stress inversion to do numerical modeling. And this was carried out at John McClellan in the PMD CRC in which he produced this very nice model of the major structural features of the Sunrise Down Gold Deposit, including the Sunrise Shear Zone, which we saw in the previous slide here. And they're basically divided into these moderately or gently to moderately dipping features, such as the Clio Sunrise Shear Zone and Carey Shear Zone, and a set of steeply dipping features, such as the Western Shear Zone here and the Dolly um, here. And he was able to take our, our stress fields from the fault inversions obtained by uh, hours and hours of detailed measurements by Mike Nugas at the mine um, and apply them to this model in FLAC and then produce these spectacular plots showing for different conditions of assumed pore fluid pressures, what the pore fluid pressure would be required to fail particular parts of the model here, pore fluid pressure required for failure, and also which elements in the model will fail in what mode, shear or tension. And these have, have got tremendously important, obviously important implications for the mineralization. The two cases shown here are for an assumed hydrostatic uh, state of pore fluid pressure regionally and a lithostatic state. So um, absolutely, well, the, the real point of, of this is to show how important a dynamic analysis is so that we have the stress field conditions as boundary conditions for numerical modeling. Okay, so I have one more thing to, 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 to mention as far as Sunrise Dam is concerned. It's another sort of dynamic analysis and it is called stress transfer modeling. The basic idea of stress transfer modeling is to investigate the changes in stress which are caused when a fault moves on other failure surfaces or potential failure surfaces. So my model here shows the regional situation at Sunrise Dam, here's the scale in kilometers, which in which the deposit itself consists at a step over between these two broadly north-south regional structures. And we know from uh, analysis of their geometry, they're likely to be strike slip, uh, strike slip faults. And we can therefore investigate the effect of a strike slip displacement on one of these structures on the state of stress on the others. That's the Coulomb stress change. This numerical modeling was actually inspired by the need to understand 
how earthquakes behaved in California and how a, a major earthquake event could make it more or less likely that other faults would subsequently move because they had increased values of this Coulomb stress state. So the, the, the sort of underpinning idea is that during the Archean, when the mineralization occurred, we, there were paleo seismic events, there were, there were earthquakes on these major faults, and those earthquakes redistributed stresses onto other faults, making them uh, more or less likely to move and therefore controlling um, mineralization. And the application of this stress transfer modeling to low gold deposits was pioneered by Steve Cox and, and Steve Micklethwaite, and um, they showed very successfully at St. Ives Goldfield how predicted areas of increased Coulomb stress could also, did also correlate, correlate with the resource. So I'm just going to show you simple, some simple results of Coulomb stress modeling, stress transfer modeling for the Sunrise Dam model without saying much more about them. So what we did was impose a realistic um, meter or so displacement on this regional strike slip fault up here and investigate those changes in Coulomb stress represented by the different colors here on structures in the orientation of Sunrise Dam and the other regional structure. And the first thing you notice is that the, the fault on which we specified the earthquake would occur reduces its stress. The stress change is a negative one, as you would expect, the stress is relieved on that fault. But the next thing we occur is that it lights up and increases the Coulomb stress on structures in the orientation, say, of the sunrise shear zone. So that is also shown in this picture here, sunrise shear zone lighting up and in a little bit more detail here. And this little panel up here in its vertical orientation is me meant to represent shear zones such as the Western shear zone. So that Coulomb stress modeling is uh, showing us that the sunrise shear is very likely to have been reactivated by earthquakes on this major fault. And in the final couple of pictures, we can investigate the situation more regionally. This is showing the Coulomb stress changes in the optimal failure planes for that strike slip movement in a regional picture. So we can see that it's not just the potential for movement on the sunrise shear zone, but in a wide area around that could have potentially been reactivated by such movement. And the next slide is just a more detailed look at that, I think. Yeah. So obviously Im important implications for exploration vindicated very much by this entire study. So I'm more or less uh, finished now the sort of technical part, part of this presentation. Just hope that I've convinced you that each one of these steps in the um, conventional structural approach would be useful in a hydrothermal situation. And I'll just finish off with four more slides, which um, I feel uh, a little bit uh, guilty about, perhaps indulging myself in gazing into a crystal ball for what is going to happen in future in structural geology and how that might have implications for uh, what we can expect in the world of hydrothermal mineralization. Those are the four directions or four directions which I think are going to continue to be very important in structural geology as they are at the moment. And uh, let me just show a few slides to illustrate them. Structural geology is focusing more and more these days on areas of active to active tectonics because we now have uh, the sophisticated tools to understand deformation much better, GPS tracking of course, and we're also able to say a lot more about stress fields. And this is a picture from the uh, world stress map of the stress state in the Asian region. And I want to use it to make uh, a couple of simple points. One is that even in an area of apparently straightforward convergence, such as the Sumatra Trench down here, we get an incredible variety of stress states side by side with each other. And the colors here are red for normal faults or normal fault stress field, green for strike slip stress field and thrust blue for a thrust fault. You can see lots of blue arrows as you would expect, but you've also got important components of normal faulting and strike slip faulting, all within close at this scale spatial proximity. So, when we actually start to analyze the in situ stress of the Earth at the present, even for a straight, apparently straightforward 
tectonic settings such as a subduction zone margin, we find that stress states are highly variable on short spatial scales. I think that has extremely important implications for using the sort of results that we looked at at Sunrise Dam um, in a more regional sense. Basically, it means that uh, analyses need to be limited to the scale of individual orbiters, at least at first. One thing we don't yet know from the in situ stress measurements is their temporal variability. We do know something about stress changes following earthquakes, but probably not at a regional scale. Yet that is likely to be extremely important as we've seen in deposits such as Sunrise Dam. And finally, it's uh, also a very big field of research going on at the moment to realize that there's a complete spectrum of deformation on fault zones between seismic slip occurring at the rate of kilometers per second and creep occurring at basically the rate of plate movement. But we now know that it's not either one or the other. There's a whole series of ge geophysical phenomena which occur at intermediate time scales, uh, which are encapsulated in the phrase episodic tremor and slip. And there's a very exciting field of structural geology concerned with looking for geological manifestations of those sorts of rates of deformation. And in fact, it is likely that the sort of laminated crack seal textures we see in many hydrothermal gold deposits might represent such deformation. So there's um, important direction of future research. Structural geology has derived always actually um, huge input from uh, material science, and that's going ahead today a pace, EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction, has become a very standard technique to apply and is revealing more and more about the formation of crystal scale fabrics. These are some spectacular examples from uh, our Cardiff EBSD setup, uh, thanks to Chris Tully, who produced these quartz C axis fabric orientations, beautifully displayed with these uh, depictions of the actual orientations of the quartz crystals indicated by the EBSD picture in the colors and this lookup scale here. Now, I just want to uh, further that discussion of EBSD by saying that um, um, my student Ben Williams, who's working at Mount Isa, is, has recently produced some utterly spectacular EBSD images of deformed sulfides from the copper ore bodies at Mount Isa. And that's a really exciting development which we're currently working on. Another aspect of work here at Cardiff University, which uh, has recently come to light thanks to Will Smith is the uh, simple technique of etching and how much it can reveal of um, pyrite substructure in this particular case in simple reflected light. Look at those incredible patterns which are just revealed by the etching, etching technique. Moving on to the, the next field which is going to continue to be important I think is, is geochronology, the interface between geochronology and structural geology which is achieved by a microscale analysis. This is something the JCU team are very adept at, looking at in situ analyses of geochronology. In this case, I've shown you, again, work from Mount Isa by Ben Cave at Adelaide, uh, looking both at appetite chemistry and geochronology from, uh, sorry, from the Ernest Henry deposit. This is, uh, this is a very promising route into solving one of those really tricky problems about uh, hydrothermal mineralization, the date of the actual mineralizing event. And finally, I think the most important exciting development is in a much broader understanding of mineralization, which includes not just deformation, but also chemistry. And this is leading us to, or some people to an understanding of how we can treat mineralization from a thermodynamic point of view. And this is, of course, inspired by the work of Alison Ward and Bruce Hobbs in a number of really formative papers in which they recognize that in a mineralizing event, there are all kinds of different processes occurring, both changes in deformation, changes in stress state, changes in temperature, chemical reactions, and that they all feed back to each other, producing a highly nonlinear system. So nonlinear uh, equilibrium, nonlinear um, thermodynamics has got a very promising um, 
basis for an approach for a much more comprehensive holistic understanding of mineralization. And the equations are all there. And what we need simply to do is to go out and apply them. And they have already started to do this again at partly at Sunrise Dam Shear Zone um, with um, working with Mark Munro, formerly from James Cook University. So I'll just finish off with some uh, rather bland sort of statements, which more or less just say the same thing as what I've already said. Geometric kinematic dynamic analysis is important. Rheology is very important. Most of this talk is from a paper submitted to, or, or now published in reviews in economic geology with my co-authors there. And I'll just leave a list of references up to finish off with and uh, be very happy to take some questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom. That's quite a lot there to have our head uh, around, but I think we do have here quite a few questions. So I will start with some questions. So please, if you have any more questions, put them in the chat and we will collect them and I will read them to, to Tom. So we can keep this discussion quite civil that way. So Tom, I will start with a question. So it says like this, with reference to the structural analysis uh, workflow, kinematic and dynamic analysis, it's critical to develop a structural controls to define the formation history and allow correlation to the regional geodynamic framework. But how necessary is it to predict extensions to an ore body beyond its inspection of drill core? Okay, Tony, thank you for that question. And nice to be in touch with you again. Um, I would still say that uh, despite the obvious reservation you have in this question, that, um, that if you're going to predict extensions to an ore body, ideally you would be able to um, understand particularly its kinematics. Um, because that really tells you or can tell you the orientation of the ore body and therefore where the extensions are going to be. So uh, yes, you need to inspect the drill core, but um, from, from that inspection of the drill core, you will hopefully be able to define a kinematic picture, which, which will allow you to, to predict ex extensions of the ore body. But I, I sense that you, you have a reservation about that process. I'm not sure quite what it is. Um, and there's a follow-up question also from, from you. Um, yeah, so I will read that question up, Tom, in case not everyone has seen it. Uh, so using the vorticity shear model technique, is there a way of predicting where on the shear plane all bodies are expected to develop in a lateral sense? For example, periodicity along strike and up, down, dip, referring to Renko example. Yes, actually, that's a really good question. Um, I think the, the periodicity is implied to some extent by those uh, measurements of the ore body shape. And if that model about ore bodies coalescing is correct, then it would be possible to say something about an average spacing of the ore bodies by treating some of the bigger ore bodies as coalesced examples of the smaller ore bodies and therefore being able to say that there, there was a sort of uh, average spacing that meant that, that, that these ore bodies, the bigger ore bodies are actually coalesced smaller ore bodies. So using simply the, um, using simply the geometrical analysis, I think that's how you might get at the spatial distribution of those ore bodies. The vorticity analysis might be important to understand what it is actually that it, what, what is actually controlling the orientation of those ore bodies. So yes, that does come into it as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's move to the next one. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the importance of complexity of chaos or perhaps changes thereof within structural networks, perhaps as evidence of self-organizing? metastable dynamic systems that many hydrothermal systems probably are. And how we go about quantifying that in practical manner? All right, great question from Alex. Um, uh, 
it's a it's a huge question. I mean, to me, it seems just inevitable that we have to get to grips with complexity, chaos, because of those those feedbacks. We know what systems with feedbacks do, um, and uh, it's just it's just an impo incredibly important development to 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 try and take further. But your your the second part of your question is is just exactly how do we is just exactly on the on the money. How do we actually go about doing that in a practical manner? Well, in the study that I referred to from Mark, Mark Munro's work at Sunrise Dam, what he looked at was drill core indices of, um, uh, well, related to alteration mineralogy, basically, and, and how that changed with grade and the spatial scales and fluctuations in um, chemistry and mineralogy uh, down a drill core. And they were able to show that the way in which they changed with scale, the mineralogy changed with scale and the grades uh, down a drill core, uh, had multifractal characteristics, which are what is predicted basically by a nonlinear um, non model. So in a not very specific way, but in a general way, finding fr fractal or multifractal characteristics is one way in which we can uh, apply the predictions of this thermodynamic approach. But I'm optimistic it, it can be actually a lot more specific than that. If we're able to uh, write down equations uh, which are actually determining the, the specific reactions which have occurred during mineralization, the precipitation reactions, and in fact, of course, Allison and Bruce have, have done that for hydrothermal gold mineralization. Um, they have written down those reactions and investigated the effects of non-equilibrium thermodynamics on predicting those reactions and how they would in fact lead to mineralization. So uh, it's just a huge field which is opening up um, to, to try and apply those equations in more detail. And the way that we will perhaps start to do that is by looking at simple properties such as the spatial distribution of alteration or um, mineralization, which have got those fractal or multifractal properties. Thanks, Tom. So here is a question about who is the student working on stress and Montaiza microscopically, and when is that work likely to be published? Okay, so um, Ben Williams is is uh, doing his PhD here at at, at Cardiff, and um, he has really, literally, only been working on on this um, in the last few months. Uh, so it's quite a long way from publication. Um, so uh, I think we would we would hope to see something perhaps in a year or so's time on that. Um, all I can tell you is that it. Well, what I really wanted to set, to use that example to say is that EBSD can apl be applied to sulfide deformation and has got enormous potential. And because uh, partly because it hasn't been done very much before, um, sulfide deformation has always been a bit of a. Uh, well, let me say that a detailed material science understanding of sulfide deformation is something. Is a, is a huge area I think that needs a lot of work on and, and EBSD is going to be a great way forward to, to looking into that. Okay, so we have here a rather long question, so I'll try to read it and see how this goes. So in the Renko gold mine, the gold bearing lithology is more competent than the surrounding mylonite, which exhibits strong mylonite fabric with stretching lineation. The mineralized unit is competent, thus explain the shear parallel shears and steeply dipping shears. In this case, one would expect the sub-horizontal intersection between the shears folds that form in this competent unit to exhibit the highest permeability. Yet the goal continuity in the competent lithology are linear and steeply plunging and orthogonal to the vorticity axis and parallel to the interpreted slip lines along these folds. This is surprising as this unit exhibit lower total strain compared to the myelonite. The question is, is there a contradiction here? Okay, uh, that is actually a great question. I completely understand wh what it means. Um, John, so thank you very much for that. Um, yes. Okay, uh, 
probably the probably the answer to your question is there may be a contradiction here. Um, the idea is, of course, if we have fracture controlled porosity in the line, in the lithons, is that those fractures would typically be intersecting in a direction perpendicular to the down dip direction, and perhaps permeability would be greater in that direction. But I think actually, you know, it's not only um, fracture control that's very important here. I think the penetrative features of the uh, myelinitic foliation themselves might actually have some importance in controlling the fluid flow. And they will, of course, be orientated in that down dip direction. So perhaps on a slightly larger scale than the small individual fractures, which create the dilatant space, there is a control on permeability by those penetrative linear fabrics in that direction. Perhaps that's that's um, that's what what we're seeing in the way in which those ore bodies are, are orientated perpendicular to the vortex vector and in that down dip direction. It may actually be something more closely connected with the, the penetrative fabrics than the small scale uh, failures which control the distribution within the lithons. But okay, I recognize that could be a contradiction. <laughs> Thanks. So this is the first question. As vorticity alienations are observed in drill core, it would imply one wouldn't need further analysis. The stereographic analysis doesn't add much to an already simple geometric relationship. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I think I, I probably agree with that, Tony. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, you you just need to to have your vorticity and the lineation. You don't once you've got that and you've understood the the kinematic picture, whether it's pure shear dominated or, or simple shear dominated, um, that's broadly all you need. And um, yeah, you, you don't need to do a lot more um, anyway, if, if, that, if, those, if you're able to decide which of those models uh, uh, obtains, that's it. Yeah. So I've done another question. In network analysis, there is a bias introduced by the observation direction. Presumably, you have to be looking at direction roughly parallel to the intersection between fracture sets. That's a great question, James. Uh, something I didn't mention is, well, okay, so I, I mentioned that a lot of this analysis was first is first applied in the hydrocarbon context. And of course, in hydrocarbons, basically, you're looking at horizontal surfaces, and many fracture sets are actually steeply dipping. So you are looking at the situation you described. In the Sunrise Dam case, fortunately, uh, almost, uh, well, no, 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 not, not by luck, but fortunately, the fracture sets were also perpendicular to the face of that drive that I showed in the example. So yes, you absolutely do need to uh, take into account the observation direction and make the so-called Terzaghi correction if you have obliquity between your observed face and your fracture face. But you can do that. You can actually make a Terzaghi correction um, if you know that angle. But definitely it is a three-dimensional problem. And in many applications of network analysis that you see in the literature, that third dimension is uh, either overlooked or it has been taken into account by the fact that the observation surface is perpendicular to the fracture intersection, just as you said, James. 